with this lecture, we round out a two-year cycle. The first year was a cycle that moved in a natural way. That natural way in ancient ritual was always a clockwise motion. One followed the path of the celestial bodies, the path of the sun. But very early on, It's difficult to say just when, but certainly by 40,000 years ago, our particular species discovered that there is always an effective reality to the response, that nature is quite real, and in like fashion, our response is also quite real. And so a counterclockwise motion was seen to be a complement to the clockwise motion of nature. And this counterclockwise motion was always an indication that man was able and willing to respond to the natural fabric. And in time, these two motions became braided together. They made a fabric of life that enabled human beings to live, men and women. This education seeks to present that fabric from the ground up all the way through the processes of shearing the sheep or the goats, carting the wool, spinning out your yarn, doing the weaving on the loom, dyeing your fabric, cutting it into appropriate clothing, and then wearing them. And so this education is a modern equivalent of the kind of educational comprehension that has characterized the history of our species for a very long time. In the past, this braiding took several forms. In Plato's time, the dialogue was a braiding of conversation, because the braiding of language at that time was extremely precarious, because the internalization of language into meaning focusing finally on symbols was in great jeopardy in Plato's day some 2400 years ago. And so the form of education was in a dialogue form. And one of the concomitants of Plato's philo philosophical dialogues was the development of Greek tragedy, where there is an antiphonal quality to the language going through a different structural form, but coming out essentially with a realization. In Aristotle's words, a denouement, a moment of truth. And in the Platonic dialogues, the moment of truth is reached not by a tragic recognition, but by a shared understanding. And that point was called aletheia, it was called truth. And the method of Plato's dialogues was such that any pro or con position can always be split into a further pro and con. And when one gets to a level that cannot be split any further, cannot be bifurcated, there is no longer a pro and con that's able to be distinguished. That then is aletheia, that then is truth. And one has reached that in conjunction with all the participants of the dialogue, whether listener or speaker. In the last 2,500 years, this particular form of education has had many champions, and today, those of us who are here still champion this tradition, this braiding together of a response to a reality with the confidence and the certainty that our response is just as real. And together, the wholeness that is made establishes for us a space of life. In this education, in this two-year cycle, we have taken the ancient quality of the annual cycle as a key, as a guide, as a template, as it were, and that annual cycle generally was distributed among four seasons. 
and at each of the junctures between seasons, at the solstices and at the equinoxes, there was always a special time set aside, a special day set aside. This day is the vernal equinox. This day is the summer solstice. This day is the autumnal equinox. This day is the winter solstice. And these four points are reserved in this educational cycle as intervals, as lectures which belong to the reality of the fabric, but which do not participate in the particular season. And so these interseasonal days are the intervals. So during the course of the year, we had a four-part structure, each part of which had 12 lectures. And those 12-part lecture series, those arcs of seasons of language, were kept distinct by an interval. And so in the first year, there were four intervals. And in the second year, there are also four intervals. And today is the eighth or last interval of the second year. This is the fourth interval of the second year, the eighth interval of the sequence. And so this particular lecture serves and has served for about 30 years in the development of this education, not only as the space of conclusion for the two-year cycle, but has served as the space for the beginning of the next two-year cycle. Now, I had intended this to be the last time that I would offer this cycle, but because of circumstances, I will offer it one more time, one more two-year uh, cycle. And so the lecture today, rather than being a concluding space, will be a space that allows for this two-year cycle to come to, let's use a Shakespearean term, a quietus. We will today a quietus make with our interval. And next week, we will begin again a final two-year cycle. And so this lecture today is a bridge between the last lecture of the eighth series, and the eighth series is always science, and the first series is always nature. And so this lecture is in between the end of science and the beginning of nature. And characteristic of the method that we have used over the last 2,000 years, the synthesizing symbol that has been operative for us is the book. And though we are entering into a new period where the book will certainly be eclipsed just as the book eclipsed the scroll, the book will be eclipsed in this next uh, very large time cycle. But for now, the quality of traditional information that we have is still synthesized, still integrated, and still differentiated by the book. And so we use pairs of texts. We pair up books to keep us from falling into the authoritative single document and into the kind of authoritarian expectation of precedent which a single book carries within its form as a hidden burr. We use pairs of texts to walk through the whole two-year cycle. But during the intervals, because the intervals are not a part of that process, because they are separate, we use a single volume, a single book. And I have chosen eight books from the world's religious literature to try to present an interval which would be meaningful for that particular interface. And the interface between science and nature has, in this education, the choice of the Bhagavad Gita. And so today, the lecture, the presentation, the quietus, is in terms of the Bhagavad Gita. I'm sure that all of you who are here are somewhat acquainted with the Gita, but perhaps uh, are not refreshed to the point to where it would be meaningful just simply to mention Bhagavad Gita.
And so I'll try to present the Gita. I have, in the past, taken many auxiliary series, and one of them I did was on the Bhagavad Gita, nine lectures. And the typescript of these nine lectures with notes is called an American reading of the Bhagavad Gita. And this is available, if some of you get interested, the nine tapes are available um, for $10 a tape, and the uh, lecture notes go with it. So I will use this as a basis, but because of the exigencies of the education, I want to modify it somewhat so that you can understand how this education works, even on such a mysterious and perhaps abstruse level as the interval between science and nature. And for that, we need to have a substitute word for science temporarily. Scientia means knowing. The largest object that can be known is called from the Greek language, cosmos. The cosmos is the largest object that we can know. It is inclusive, and the alternate word for cosmos is universe, one place. That is all. The oneness of all. The one which is everything. And so this universe, this cosmos, is the differential object which knowing would understand. Now from the science sequence that we just finished, from those 12 lectures, you understand now that by the end of the 20th century, nearly the beginning of the 21st century, we're aware in our knowing, men and women very much like ourselves are aware, that in terms of reality, existence exhausts its formal possibilities long before reality ceases. So that e existence is a form. Whatever exists is always a form within a context that is larger and other than the form. And so the cosmos as a form, the universe as a form, has an existence, but its existence also takes place within a reality which is larger than itself, larger than its form. And we've seen through this education that the ancient method of achieving a penetration through form, through existence, to that contextual reality that penetration is always a function of integration. It's always a bringing together, a condensing, a honing, a sharpening. But that that process has a limit beyond which, though the method still works, we are not aware that it is working. And so in the ancient mystery quality of expression, one would say that the final stage of integration is an acceptance. That acceptance forms the culmination of integration. That there is a space of accepting. And in the quality of ancient traditions, this space of acceptance was always the fulcrum, the focus, the, the place where sacrifice had its efficacy. And all of the ritual comportment focused upon that center, that central space, where sacrifice has its efficacy. And that this acceptance, then, was rather in the nature of a gift, rather than an achievement. Rather than being a culminating accomplishment of ours, 
we end our integration with open hands, with an open heart, with an open mind. And what we are gifted with is the openness of the heart, the openness of the mind, the openness of the hand. And it's this very openness that was symbolized some 40,000 years ago. The very first symbol that appears in Paleolithic art is the human hand, stenciled onto the drawings of the animals that form the basis of life. And these hands are stenciled not in a drawing way. It wasn't that one hand drew another hand, but the ancient technique was always to put the emulsion of the color in your mouth and mulch it just like a little swig of Listerine and to blow with your breath onto the hand, leaving the stencil of the hand. This quality of the stenciled imprint of the open hand is the first symbol in our particular species on this particular planet, this particular star system. It is not only a symbol of the graspability of understanding, but it is most mysteriously a symbol of the acceptance of the mystery beyond what we could grasp. And so in ancient Greece, in the great forum that formed the basis of the Agora in Athens, there was a long arcade building called the Stoa. And the philosophers who were there teaching and arguing among themselves were called Stoics because of the Stoa. And the clinching argument was always cinched by a fist. Did you get it? I got it. And it's this graspability that is the way in which a language of existence is brought to some kind of focus. But further up, above the Agora, above the Stoa, on the Acropolis, one finds not the clenched fist of the philosopher, but one finds a single large building dominating the Parthenon. And the Parthenon, Parthenos meaning virgin, meant the goddess Athena. And inside the Parthenon, there were two rooms. One room which kept the treasure. It was the treasury of the city of Athens, all the money. And on the other side of the wall was a 40-foot statue of Athena, out of wood and ivory, and cloaked with a peplos, a cloak that had embroidered on it all of the mythological figures of the Homeric pantheon. And the women of Athens washed that cloak every year down at the sea at the Piraeus and brought it back up in a great procession and redraped Athena there in the Parthenon. And one did not find a clenched fist in Athena, but what one found was the equanimous gaze of her eyes. And the eyes of Athena were the color of the sea at its disappearing horizon against the sky. Where the blue-gray disappears, her eyes were of that color. Her eyes were the color of the disappearing horizon of this earth, which was symbolic then of the ability to see beyond beyond the horizon. And it's this gaze of Athena, this clear-eyed, tranquil gaze of Athena, that was more powerful than the clenched arguments of the philosophers. And so one finds in something like the Bhagavad Gita, for the Greek and the Indian cultures, in many ways, were complements of each other. Compliments in a sense that though they form a whole, very often the deep working parts worked in a different way, where in Greece it would go counterclockwise, in India it would go clockwise. That kind of complementation. And we'll see today that the Bhagavad Gita is in fact 
a very curious kind of literature. It forms, in fact, a genre all by itself. In the introduction to the Penguin Classics edition of the Bhagavad Gita, which has been in print now for some 33 years, translated by the Spanish mystic Juan Mascaro, a very good translation, but there are some emendations that I would recommend to your attention. One of them is his statement on page 10 of his introduction that Sanskrit, the great language of India, the Bhagavad Gita being in Sanskrit, among all the other great examples of literature, Mascaro tells us that the Greeks had two kinds of literature that did not appear in Sanskrit. They had history and they had tragedy. Histories and tragedies, and that there are no histories nor tragedies in Sanskrit. And I would recommend for your consideration that the Bhagavad Gita is a tragedy. It is a, an Indian tragedy, not a Greek tragedy, and that the point of recognition, the denouement, is sharp enough to penetrate through, whereas the Greek tragedy was always an approach that came up to that point of recognition, but never penetrated through. And so there were many Greek tragedies. Aeschylus himself wrote over 90. But in India, the Bhagavad Gita was the first and only tragedy, because it not only reached that denouement that point, but penetrated through. And the whole purpose of the yogic intelligence of the tragic form in India is that one does not have to again and again and again approach a point of recognition, that one can not only penetrate through it, but inhabit the beyond. And so in India, from the time of the Bhagavad Gita on, there is a word that is used, and the word occurs also in Greek and in Western languages, as well as in Indian languages. And the word is para, and para means beyond. And it's this, like, parapsychology, or in Buddhism, it's, the Buddha called it the parayana, the way beyond. And that this way beyond has a particular mysterious nature. The way beyond is the vanishing away of doubt, the vanishing away of resistance. And the most peculiar quality of the Indian genius is that the method, the way to vanish doubt, to vanish re resistance, is to recognize its existence, first of all. The very first noble truth of the Buddha was that suffering is real. But because suffering is real, it means then that the end of suffering must also be real in exactly that way. Because suffering exists, the end of suffering must also exist. For any form that has existence by the laws of the universe must have a definition, it must have a boundary, it must have a shape. And we'll see that the Bhagavad Gita specifies, in fact, that it is a time-bound form that is embodied. And all embodied time-bound forms have an end. And so existence, by its own quality imparts to anything that participates in existence an end. And so while ignorance exists, the end of ignorance also exists. And the Bhagavad Gita as a karma yogic continuity assures the teaching that the way to end suffering, the way to end existence, the way to vanish doubts, the way to vanish resistance, is first of all to recognize it, to see its existence. But one needs to see its existence as a complete form, 
And once that form is completed and one sees this, all by itself, the complementary counterclockwise movement comes into play. Because as soon as the completeness occurs in existence, its complement, which is in existence the polarity, comes into play. And just as, as soon as existence completes itself, non-existence begins to occur. As soon as one reaches the apex of one part of a polarity, at that apex the other part of the polarity comes into play all by itself. It is universal law. It is what is called in India Dharma. On the level of existence, it would be law. On the level of reality, beyond existence, it would be truth. And so Dharma has the double quality of being law and of being truth. Now the Bhagavad Gita's way, its method, is similar to Buddhism, but distinct and different from it in several regards. In Buddhism, the classic teaching of the Buddha was always that an integral crests before your ability to follow exhausts itself. So that integration of any form whatsoever in existence, any existential form, will complete itself before you exhaust your capacity to attend to it. All that you have to do is calibrate your attention, your concentration, to a finer point than things. And when you can learn to see finer than things, your seeing will continue after things have reached their conclusion. And it's this seeing after the completion that is called bodhi, enlightenment. The enlightenment not of being able to see things, but the enlightenment of being able to see light by which all things are visible. And so this quality is characteristic of Buddhism. In the Bhagavad Gita, there is a slightly different presentation of this. The presentation in the Bhagavad Gita is not based on enlightenment so much as the enlightened being. In Sanskrit, the word would be purusha, the light body of the person who is able to go beyond existence into reality. And so this glowing light body, this Purusha, this cosmic person, exists beyond any kind of forms. When the roles are exhausted, there is still this actor. When the acting is exhausted, there is still this being. And when all being is exhausted, there is still this glory. And so the Bhagavad Gita posits the ability of our attention, our concentration, to not only follow integration to its vanishing point, but to follow the vanishing long enough to see that out of the vanishing comes a completely different form. That as integration vanishes, and for a while, nothing is happening, nothing is there. If one continues to abide with that nothing happening for a while, who knows how long, for time itself has been exhausted, all time form bodies are discontinuous. But our spiritual attention is continuous. And in that continuity, which was developed by staring at the stars, staring at the night sky long enough to see that there were patterns among the stars. One can learn to see that there are patterns in existence. And when those patterns integrate, 
the very context which allowed those patterns to occur reoccurs all by itself. And mysteriously, out of that vanished integration, a differential continuum opens up. And in that differential continuum, there are two great realities. One is the Purusha, the spiritual person, and the other is the shining cosmos. And that these two are related, just as a parent and child are related. And that this pair is a great mystery that not only exist, but are real beyond existence. And so the Bhagavad Gita talks in this way. Now, just as we used in our education a technique of coming back after speaking for a while, after using language for a while, and uh, I know that uh, we're used to sound bites in the 1990s and that attention should not be able to be extended beyond five minutes, or there are all sorts of technical limitations that you must learn to ignore. <laughs> Uh, the old uh, saying in uh, I Iranian culture is that uh, when demons occur, they always have tails, and the way to stop them is you tie, th tie their tails into knots. And they're so egotistical that they spend all their tri time trying to unknot their tails, and they leave you alone. <laughs> so uh, just uh, knot the tails of the machines and of those procedures that say that your attention span can't go beyond few seconds, few minutes, uh, your yogic capacity is eternal. <laughs> you could wait out the end of time. You could observe the end of hydrogen as an element, even though it takes 10 to the 43rd years to exhaust its form. It still ne nevertheless happens. All we need is enough attention to get through two years of Saturdays. And with that, with that 104 in a row, attentive, we don't even need the whole days, just a couple of hours of each day. With just 208 hours of concentration, we can learn to see beyond. In this technique, there was always this recursive this coming back again, returning to the base. This is a process which we recognize as characteristic of life, that all life structures return back to its base. It's like the DNA strands have a phosphate uh, sugar base, which any particular molecule always eventually returns back to it, has its link back to this base. The neural system is always linked to the spinal column. And so this spine, this base, this backbone, this basic plane of reference is essential in an education. And our essential backbone here is the ability to be present. Everything that we do is functional on the ability to be present, to let go of tiredness, to let go of distractions. And so you can see it's like a meditation. But our lives, our training, our background are largely antithetical, if not just oblique, to the kind of concentration that is necessary. And so simply reoccurring every Saturday morning is a form of concentration. The time sequence doesn't really matter in reality. It matters in existence, but on level of reality, it doesn't matter. As long as the continuity is built, one builds an accrued penetration. There are a couple of esoteric thinkers in world history who have developed this whole accumulated penetration philosophy. One of them in the West was Alfred North Whitehead, who wrote a book about it called Process and Reality, which was almost unreadable. And when I was in university 35 years ago, they would 
toss you process and reality if you thought that you were getting uh, very competent in philosophy and <laughs> later on you would come back shaking your head. Well, about six years later, uh, uh, six years ago, they published a new edition of Process and Reality and they cleaned up all the typographical errors <laughs> that had been put into it decades ago. And no wonder no one could read it. <laughs> they didn't have Whitehead's script. And now one can go to Process and Reality and with difficulty nevertheless understand what the man was saying. That the process of accumulation builds <coughs> its own penetration through to reality. And this, uh, as a matter of fact, was the great uh, development in a particularly esoteric form of Buddhism in China. It's called uh, Hua Yen Buddhism, and what it means is golden flower Buddhism. And I'm sure some of you are acquainted with Carl Jung's commentary on the secret of the golden flower. And uh, it's presented in its Taoist form there. But the Hua Yen golden flower is based upon a very large sutra. Um, the sutra uh, takes about three volumes to translate. All of this is to say that the process that we use here to recursively come back to the base is time-tested. It works. It works on a very high level, a very deep level, but nevertheless it works. And because it works on reality rather than existence, you do not have to understand it. You do not have to know it now, but you can recall it later. And it's this ability to remember, to recollect, that is the functioning I guess uh, we need to use a, an old-fashioned word. It's the trigger. It was the trigger in Plato's education, recollection, that true learning is remembering, that the deepest knowing is remembering, that the cognition of something is always the cognition of its existential form. But the recognition takes the existential form and its context together so that one recognizes what it is for, what it does, what its nature is, not simply that it is. And so cognition is always a cognition of a representation. And the representation in standard form is usually an image of sorts. It can be an audio image. It could be an image in smell. It could be a tactile image. But generally it's a visual or an audio image. And these images as representations induce a constructing the word for which we take from Aristotle and it's called mimesis. Miming by our repeating what we see. Monkey see, monkey do. And an education that limits itself to that level, well, it produces a lower order of primate than we would wish to inhabit. <laughs> and so we must go beyond representation, beyond images. Notice the beyond again. What is beyond representation? Presentation. What is beyond images? symbols. And once one operates with the presence of symbols in the mind, then a different quality occurs. One goes beyond the natural integral order, the ritual-based comportment of existence of time-formed bodies. And one begins to deal with re relationalities. And it's the symbolic vision of relationalities that opens up the differential universe. In ancient Egypt, the pyramids were built because the Egyptian mathematicians mastered the ability to find two-thirds of any number. Now they didn't understand higher mathematics. They certainly didn't understand calculus, either integral or differential. 
but they had a very good grasp of relationalities and with the two-thirds method rule they could develop and did develop a fantastic architecture. If you get interested there is a beautiful book that uh, Dover has published, Mathematics in the Time of the Pharaohs, which goes into this particular treatment. Well, if the Egyptians could do all that with just one knack, one trick of relationality, think what you could do with an infinite number of them available. And so this education always returns to the base recursively, coming back coming back to that spinal column, to that, that basic presence, and not a representation, not a mimesis, but a presence, our presence. And when we do so, we recognize, we recognize that not only are we present, but others around us are present, and that the shared presence together constitutes a reality, not as a form, not as an image, but as a kind of a concourse, an ongoingness, a continuity. And it's this continuity which in the Bhagavad Gita forms the spinal column of its movement. The Bhagavad Gita as a book is based upon, it has 18 parts, and it's based upon the shortest Upanishad, the Isa Upanishad, which has 18 verses. And each of the 18 verses in the Isa Upanishad is the quintessence, the distilled essence, the fifth essence, the quint essence of a whole tradition developed by a genre of literature called the Upanishads. And the Upanishads themselves came out of a movement where the record of this language was not called Upanishads originally, but they were called Aranyakas. It's a, it means forest teaching. It means that you learned it in the forest. Not in the city, not in the village, not on the farm, but in the forest, in the wild places. And these teachings in the wild places were individuals who were able to live in that wildness. And that wildness originally was not the forests of lower India, but were the Himalayas. And up in the Himalayas, originally before the Aranyakas, there were the Vedas. And the Vedas were brought over the Himalayas. They were brought into India about 3,500 years ago, more or less. And those Vedas collected together form what today is called the Rig Veda. And you can recut the Rig Veda so that it can be presented as the Atharva Veda or several other, other Vedas. And so in Indian tradition, the Bhagavad Gita as a genre, as a lineage, is a singularity. It's the only example of Indian tragic form, which is the distilled essence of the Upanishads, which themselves are distilled out of the Aranyakas, which themselves are abstruse presentations of the essential symbolic pattern of the Vedas. And so, in a very curious way, one has this great Himalayan range of the Vedas, and the rivers that run down fructify the forests, and in the forest there are those teachers who brought together in themselves and in their teachings an essence. And the Bhagavad Gita is the quintessence of all those teachings brought to a singularity. And so the Bhagavad Gita is very rare. It's a gem, it's a jewel that is incomparable in the sense that there is nothing to compare it to. In the Isa, Upanishad, one finds again and again this ability to recognize, to remember that what you return to is not a what. Who you return to is not a who. And the where you return 
is not aware. And that awareness of no where has a very particular, peculiar quality. And that quality is a seed. And that seed, when it grows, becomes the flower, which is the cosmos. Let's take a little break and we'll come back. And so we're talking about the Bhagavad Gita. Now, if you went to find the Bhagavad Gita today, you would go to a bookstore and you would find the Bhagavad Gita. But originally, in ancient India, you would not find the Bhagavad Gita separate like this. You would find the Bhagavad Gita in the great epic, the Mahabharata, where it forms the sixth section. And that part of the Mahabharata, the Mahabharata has also this kind of 18-part series. If you took a pole, a bar, a shaft, and you held it two-thirds of the way back from the front so that one-third was behind and two-thirds was in front. This is the power point of the dynamic of that shaft. If you took a six-foot shaft and you wanted to balance it, you would hold it in the center with three feet on either side, and you could balance it. But if you wanted to throw that shaft, you would grab it about four feet back, and that's the power point for a dynamic throw. Now this was true in ancient India and in ancient Greece. For instance, one of the great statues of Zeus is Zeus in the attitude of throwing a lightning bolt. Zeus's spears are lightning bolts. It means that this quality of divinity is not the stasis of equanimity, like the eyes of Athena, like the feminine equanimity of the completeness, but the equanimity of Zeus or of the masculine, which is dynamic and it has its projected focus, rather than the presence being here, the presence is here, but the here is inclusive of a relationality. This relationality has a time quality. In fact, it's called time arrow, contemporary physics. It means that any dynamic, any motion, any action has this time element in it. That action is time calibrated. And so one can see in the Bhagavad Gita that Krishna asks a very reasonable question of Arjuna, and Arjuna replies with an equally penetrating question. What Krishna wants to know from Arjuna is, why are you hesitating? You are the greatest warrior of this age, of this time, and both sides of a tremendous struggle are aligned. And this field of battle, this Kurukshetra, which is outside of uh, uh, Delhi today, in old Delhi, this field of battle is there near the Jumna River. And the whole fate of the world is going to be decided. And here are these two lines these two armies, with their war elephants and their huge plumes and their glistening jewels and their bronze weapons and their fierce eyes and manly pride and arrogance sizzling in the air 
and you here, the greatest warrior of all, are afraid to fight. And Krishna wants to know what's going on. And his question to Arjuna, he's driven the chariot into the space in between the battle lines. And in that presence of the pause, God asks man, do you know who you are? And Arjuna, who is not a fool, not just some kind of macho warrior, but a man capable of discernment, and capable of penetration, a spiritual man, says to Krishna, if there's something beyond action, why do you urge me to action? Why don't you urge me to the beyond? And Krishna takes, accepts Arjuna's question and opens it up. The opening of the question is a philosophic technique developed in Greece largely, but in India it had a variant and in the Bhagavad Gita is the peculiar, singular example of the way in which this is opened up. Now in Greece, the opening up was always done in the context of a dialogue. And very often, the dialogues did not take place in a static way of two people leaning against a post, but they took place within a walk, where you would be walking together. Plato's school was a garden, a library and a garden, much like this here. And you would take walks together in this garden, in this park, and discuss. Now, the way in which I was introduced to the Bhagavad Gita in the late 1950s, I was taught the Bhagavad Gita initially by an agronomist, a soil engineer at the University of Wisconsin. He was from Nagpur in central India, in the Deccan, in the plains, Mr. Sudarshan Puri. And he was shocked to observe in an argument that I was engaged in, in uh, what was the, uh, the, the student argument place at the University of Wisconsin, was called the Rathskelter, <laughs> just like a, a, a Gertian grotto. It had monkeys with steins of beer painted on the walls and the arches, and we would argue there. And I was a youngster arguing with graduate students about wisdom and things like that. And Mr. Sudarshan Puri heard in my arguments that I did not understand certain very fundamental things, especially something which the Bhagavad Gita taught. And so he took me aside and he said, you're not going to sleep tonight until you've heard the Bhagavad Gita. And I will recite it for you, and I will do my best to present it to you, and you will do your best to listen. Otherwise, I'll beat you up. <laughs> No, he didn't say that. It was winter time, and the University of Wisconsin is on Lake Mendota, and it's very cold. And we walked and walked along the bank and the edge of Lake Mendota for miles, and I listened to the Bhagavad Gita. And so I got it in a way which is memorable to me, and I try to pass a little bit of this on to you. Arjuna says, I understand that you're saying there's a reality beyond action, so why do you urge me to act? And Krishna replies, opening up that question, he says, the mind which knows is based on action. If you don't act, there will be no foundation for the mind to really occur. That the first way in which existence is rooted is in what we do, and so we have to do things, we have to live. Before you can ask the meaning of life, you must live. And so you must act before you can know that action. That if you reverse this, you go into a degeneration. 
you go into a fantasy mode, you go into delusion. And it's possible that you are ensconced in delusion, and this is why you are afraid to act. Because in the understanding, in the fineness of pro and con about anything, eventually the pros and cons are equally distributed 50-50. And the more refined you become at thinking without acting, the less that you will do anything. We call today that state of being able to see both sides equally well so that you do not act at all, catatonic schizophrenia. <laughs> Welcome to the hospital. And so Krishna again presents to Arjuna a way out of this death madness limbo of doubt. And the way to vanish that doubt is to have your concentration occur longer than the existence of the problem-solution duality. Because eventually that duality will come into its own 50-50. But your equilibrium, your horizon, your disappearing horizon will be like the gaze of Athena. It will go beyond what exists. If we're caught up in either side, either pro or con, if we are caught up in either side, then the balance will not achieve an equilibrium, but will always tilt, it will always skew to one or the other. And as we skew to one or the other, this devolution into delusion occurs. It's almost like an automatic. And so the way to unhook ourselves from this skewing tendency is to view pro and con with equanimity. And the only way to do that is to renounce the fruits of action. It's the clinging to the fruits of action that produce the initial veer that eventually, no matter how small, ends up being askew. A millionth of a degree doesn't mean much with a circle six inches in diameter, but when you get out to four or five billion light years, you're way off. You won't even see the star system you need to be in. So this quality in eternity means not only that you veer off, but that you engage in a huge circle of ignorance that may take you who knows how long to traverse and to what point. To what purpose? It's actually a waste. It's a waste of time and energy. But to unhook this, this bait, this fruits of action, one must understand that the equanimity that's here becomes complicated because we do not have just simply a pro and con which the philosophers would give us, but that there's a three-part quality here that needs to be balanced. A three-fold quality. Now the words that were used for this three-fold quality in the Bhagavad Gita were developed in what was called the Sankhya, the Sankhya philosophy. And the three qualities were the Sattva as the goodness, the Rajas as the passion and the tamas as the darkness. That the, the, the tamas is a, is a pride of clinging to. The rajas is an arrogance of being able to juggle and the sattva is the ability to transcend. 
If you keep clinging, you will electrocute yourself. If you juggle, your own cleverness will eventually juggle you. Only the sattva, the transcendence, purifies. And this quality of this purification by renunciation is not the renunciation of things, but the renunciation of the projected fruits of action. For if the mind has its quality of existence, the mind has a form, a time-bound form, that mind's time-bound form needs the basis, the spine, the recursive phosphate upon which it occurs is the body. The development of Indian logic has always in its assumptive processes that the tactility of touch is the initial guarantor of certainty. Whereas in the West, in the Greek-based West, the guarantor of certainty was that one was using the word in the right way. But it turns out that this is very elusive. Using the word in the right way is extremely elusive. But founding logic upon the certainty of touch exemplified in the Buddha's wonderful story of the blind men feeling the elephant. And that individually each one came up with something else. The trunk is a serpent, the leg is a tree. It's only by the complete gestalt, that feeling, that touch must be complete. And that if touch is complete, it's very certain. One still uses in the West a cognate phrase, I am touched by your sincerity. Have you proved their sincerity? No, but you have felt it. You have been touched by it. Because presence resonates. And touch, in its resonance, comes to a certain, let's use the musical term, consonance. And when there is a consonance, one understands that here there is a harmonic. Now these words turn out to be very Pythagorean in the West, and Pythagoras uh, not only studied 22 years in Egypt, but 11 years in Persia. And so in the Pythagorean tradition, one has this kind of quality of the touch of the East, the touch of India. Let's come back. Let's take a look at the way in which the Far East expressed this quality of presence. At the very beginning of this course, next week, the pair of books that we take will be Thoreau, the portable Thoreau, and the I Ching. Something from the East and something from the West. Thoreau and the I Ching. And we'll see that in the very first nature lecture, January 6th, which is Epiphany, the very first lecture, the very first thing that will be said is that when Tao moves, it is Te. Tao dynamically is Te. Te, when it achieves stillness, is Tao. So that there's not a sense of duality, but there's a sense that movement creates a polarity. Movement itself creates a polarity. Action, pragmatos, karma. Karma creates a polarity by its activity, by itself. And it's not just the polarity of where you left to where you're going, 
that's a spatially limited, there's also a time element here. There's a sequentiality. So that the space with the time gives the sense of a line. And so movement is best described as a line. The movement of that line need not just be straight, nor simply straight or curved, but it can describe a very complex, almost a chaotic configuration, any configuration. But whatever configuration is described by the dynamic moving line, that's the basis of a geometry. And the simplest way to begin to understand complex fractal geometries, which are certainly rational and real, is to understand the straight line, which is the Euclidean geometry. And so geometricity is a quality of space-time, always. What Krishna is saying to Arjuna is that you are trapped in a structure of your own geometricity to escape which you must escape from yourself because you have become totally identified with this. And this geometricity is not simply a line, but it's the sattva, the rajas, the tamas. It's these three together which have braided themselves into a tremendously complex knot. And the ge geometry of this knot is such that you cannot escape it by any action which you do which does not have knowing to the point of penetration. But knowing to the point of penetration without an action basis would simply be a mist in front of the knot and do nothing about the knot at all. And so Arjuna, listening to Krishna, trying to follow, trying to keep his concentration in the chariot, hears this kind of uh, presentation. In the very center of the Bhagavad Gita, it has uh, 18 sections and so the eighth and ninth uh, uh, sections lead up to the very center of the Bhagavad Gita. And the ninth section of the Bhagavad Gita, coming almost to the center of it, where one could hold the line of the language. What is that line of the language? What is a line of language? The Greek word for it was mythos. The mythos, the plot the movement of the language, the line of the movement of the language. And the line of the movement of any language has a geometricity. Whether we can initially see it or not, it is possible to discover it. At the center of the mythos of the Bhagavad Gita, we find the yoga of royal knowledge and royal mystery. Royal knowledge and royal mystery. Krishna is presenting to Arjuna, but Arjuna is still representing what Krishna is presenting. And Arjuna is representing it to himself. So in a very curious way, he cannot hear Krishna without the veil of his own representation. He does not hear Krishna directly, but he hears Krishna represented by himself. So he hears his own representation. And all of his delusion, all of his doubts, all of his uncertainty, go into weaving a very interesting sieve, so that whatever Krishna says comes through this sieve and the representation then, instead of being pure, the pure presence of Krishna, is simply a modification of Krishna a la Arjuna.
Now in the West, in the Greek West, this sieve quality was discovered in Alexandria. One of the great geographers of the world, a man named Eratosthenes, who was the first individual to very accurately plot the size of the Earth. He took the observations of far travelers and the dimensions of the sun overhead at wells in various places of the Earth, and he came very close to the actual dimensions of the Earth, which were unbelievable in Hellenistic times. That a planet could be that size, that the Earth was so huge, meant that the known world was only one-ninth of what the whole planet was. So they dismissed it. But Eratosthenes came up with what was called the sieve, which was a series of seven levels, which starts with a single undifferentiated bar, and the second level is a duality, one and two, yes and no. The third is four, two yes and two no, one yes and one no for one yes, one yes and one no for a no, and so on, seven levels. So it was a computer. Eratosthenes' sieve is a Hellenistic computer, and it was used to fractionate arguments. Just like you take raw petroleum and by fractionating it in distilling processes you come out with different products, Eratosthenian sieve was a Hellenistic computer that fractionated arguments. And it was discovered that the kind of teaching that's here in the Bhagavad Gita, if this process of fractionation is applied to it, it recursively circles back upon the user. And instead of you sieving it, it sieves you. So the Bhagavad Gita is a tragedy in the making that if you only are able to hear yourself, you will not hear the Bhagavad Gita and it will be a tragedy. But if you hear the Bhagavad Gita, coming through your veiled hearing, that tragedy will be one of penetration rather than death. In the ninth section of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, the most secret mysterious wisdom is based on written language which is holy, which is sacred. And that this written language is consonant with experience, but consonant with experience that has been transformed. If one simply followed the natural movement of language, that natural movement of language would always be mythic. And the movement of a mythic language is always on rollers of images. And these images link together all by themselves in plots that are like threads that are consistent with nature. And so no matter how you begin, no matter where you enter, as long as you stay on the mythic horizon, experience will always find the ruts that are established by natural tendencies. And so whatever actions you do will be less and less free the more that you do them. And the more and more they will follow the pre-established ruts, the threads well-worn by natural tendencies. So a mythic language, a mythos, a mythic line of development in language eventually clings more and more to a ritual basis. And the criteria for truth will always be the body. It will always reduce back 
act out to the body. It will always be the arrogant, egotistical format of, I feel this is the way it should be. Well, of course you do. How else would you feel? And it has to refer, it has to referentially come back to your body. Whereas a written language, a written language rather than a spoken language, a written language is symbolic rather than mythic. A written language, by being symbolic, transforms the direction of the reference. In a mythic language, the reference are always ritualistic. They always go back. But in a symbolic language, they always go in. Symbolically, language interiorizes more and more. Meaning condenses more and more. It integrates. Symbols accelerate the integration process. It reaches a speed where you're no longer going to fall back to earth each time, but you're free of it. Symbolic language is fast enough, quick enough, that it can escape the natural world. And so one says that by developing symbols, one develops an interior world, an interior realm. And Krishna is saying to Arjuna, this interior realm, is beyond the tapestry woven simply by sattva, rajas, and tamas. But the way to find it is to purify the focus so that your consonance is able to go beyond. And that this was, in ancient times, a wisdom which was left only to kings, which is why it was called the royal road. The royal wisdom. Not everyone needed to know. And not even a number of people needed to know. But the king must know. Because if the king doesn't know, everything is lost. And so the great mysterious teaching was always the wise man to the king. And so the archetype is always Merlin and Arthur. It's always that. The wise man must teach the king. Aristotle must teach Alexander the Great. Because only in that tandem does it work. Does what work? Does the interior world of symbolic understanding anneal itself to the actual world where ritual action is done? Only then do the symbols of the mind come into consonance with the rituals of the body. Only then is there knowing action, intelligent action. And so the mind becomes objectively real, just like the body is objectively real. One can touch the body, but one can also touch the mind. And when you can touch the mind, logic changes from being a single referent to being an ambidextrous re um, referent procedure. In myth, the reference are always back to nature. They're always back through images to nature. One always comes back to pointing to something or tapping it. The table is real. No, the table is not real. What is real is that this finger and the table together make the sound and it's the relationality that is real. The relationality is as real as the table. And while the table can only sit here, we can take the relationality, it's mobile, and we can apply it many, many, many times over. And Arjuna is tr struggling on the level of mythic hearing, well, Krishna is talking to him on level of symbolic recognition. And constantly, as Arjuna circles round, Krishna does not move. And because he does not move, 
Arjuna's circling in and of itself establishes kinesthetically the quality of a center. Now we talked about this about a month ago, about how you tame a wild horse. A wild horse is tamed by a single rope, a line, called a tether. You drive a stake into the ground, you tie one end of the rope to the stake and the other end to the, hor uh, to the horse, it doesn't choke. And eventually, you leave that horse there with the tether. Eventually, the horse learns about the tether, the line, that radius of the circle of activity, and that's the first lesson in being tamed, to being rideable. The same thing with tethering the mind. But the tether of the mind must be in terms of one's actions. But one's actions always entails this quality not only of the duality of the polarity, but the very complex permutations of the triad, the triple. And if you favor one above the other, you will always get a kind of a two-thirds quality. If you try to be purely good, emphasize sattva only, the skew will come into play just as if you were emphasizing one or the other. In the Bhagavad Gita, it's the focus of all three. And at that point of focus, there's a consonance, usually left to the teaching of the royal mystery, and the process was called, the words in English are, distilling the purest essence. Distilling. In the Zener translation of the Bhagavad Gita published by Oxford, the translation is, to the understanding evident with righteousness enhanced, how easy to carry out and it abides forever. Men who put no faith into this law of righteousness fail to reach me and must return to the road of reoccurring death. But those who have no faith in this truth come not unto me. They return always in these cycles of life and death. This kind of curlicue, habitual rut, is the very essence. It's like the bubbly foam that's the essence of the structure of uh, delusion. Illusion is misseeing, but delusion is misunderstanding. An illusion occurs perceptually, a delusion occurs conceptually. When the mind is deluded, its delusion is much more powerful than the illusion of the eye. The delusion of the mind, or the third eye, if you wish, is much more serious than the illusion of the eye. The practice of parlor magic, ledger domain, the magician who is able to fool you by movements of the hand, so that you misperceive what is being done. That's the popular term now for a ma magician, magic. Magic is being able to move the hand in such a way that the eye does not pick it up. And the basis of it, of course, is a staccato-like motion with the hand. And in the staccato-like motion, you give the illusion of continuous movement, but you reserve back a part of the movement for the a counter movement, and you can deceive in this way. The, this kind of deception, while it's very difficult to pick up with the hand, is almost impossible to pick up with the mind. Just as the hand is much quicker than the eye, the mind is much quicker than the hand.
And so a mind that is conditioned to misperceiving cannot crack the delusion of misconception. It just is impossible to do. But perception is always based upon a movement, which is an action, which is a karma. And so the Bhagavad Gita, in a very refined way, is the, is the tragedy of the karma yoga. The tragedy being, we must act. We must do. We cannot reserve ourselves in some superior way that we know better, that we think better, and cannot act, should not act, will not act that that always is a delusionary uh, opening. So at the very end of the Bhagavad Gita, when you come to the last part of it, the 18th section, Arjuna's last reply to Krishna in the Penguin Classics translation, by thy grace, by your grace, I remember my light. And now gone is my delusion. Now the, the word that's used in Sanskrit for gone, gata, this, this word uh, was refined later on in the Mahayana. And uh, gata became a part of a talismanic chant that characterized the the epitome of wisdom for about seven or eight hundred years in, in Asia, both in India and in China, and also in Japan and Korea. Um, the, the mantra, the talismanic mantra in which Gata appeared was Gate Gate Paragate Bodhisvaha. And it means that in the repetition of vanishing, of goneness, one finds a paragate, one finds a, a meta gone. How does this work? Misconception has to be made based on misperception. And the misperception must have in its structure a ritual comportment. If you have a way of hooking a recursive development into a ritual comportment, no matter what ritual comportment it is, no matter how bad or how weird, by hooking this little telltale trailer into it, it will work itself out. <laughs> It's like introducing a cure for knots into any knot. A knot, incidentally, in mathematics is a one-dimensional self-avoiding uh, uh, line in a three-dimensional context. If you introduce a fourth-dimensional context into that, all knots eventually will be unable to sustain themselves. Why? because they only work with certain structural conditions. And by modifying the very structural conditions, modifying them especially in a way in which they vanish themselves, they work themselves out, you can change any particular ritual comportment so that instead of devolving continuously in a circle-like process, it eventually evolves no matter how slowly, into a spiral process. And the difference between uh, this is the difference between hearing Ar Arjuna and hearing Krishna. Krishna is the spiral out to the splendor of the cosmos. Arjuna initially is the circle of self-certainty, which is certainly closed. So at the end of the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna has heard He's not heard Krishna 
vis-a-vis -vis Arjuna, but Arjuna's hearing and Krishna's speaking have come together into one thing. They've achieved an interface where the duality has vanished, where the polarity has vanished. And so Arjuna is able to say, by your grace, I remember my light. By your gift, by charas, light occurs in memory, in remembrance. And so, gone is my delusion. Where did the delusion go? The delusion dissolved, and incidentally it dissolves in such a way that it leaves no trace whatsoever. In the Samkhya, it's called no remainder, and it means that it was purely a perspectual illusion in the first place. It could not possibly have been real. Anything that has existence leaves a trace of itself. Doubt leaves no trace of itself whatsoever. Not even a burnt out carbon atom. No whisper at all of anything. And so it is pure nothingness. Much ado about nothing is a precise statement. Krishna does not speak after Arjuna. In the Bhagavad Gita, all of a sudden, on the page, instead of this dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna, the narrator of the Bhagavad Gita comes into play. His name is Sanjaya. And you realize that all this time, the Bhagavad Gita is a dialogue between Krishna and Arjuna that is related by a third person, Sanjaya, the blind seer, who is able to hear what's going on on the far distant battlefield down there, even though he cannot see. And because he cannot see, because he is blind, he has grown up without the normal delusions because he does not have the normal misperceptions. Illusion doesn't occur with him. And because he is a singer, he has always had the consonants, the harmonic of his hearing, based upon music, musical scales. And with the musical ear, tuned to the harmonics of pitch, Sanjay is able to hear this conversation exactly right. And we have not heard anywhere in the Bhagavad Gita Krishna talking to Arjuna. We have heard Sanjaya giving the rendition of Krishna talking to Arjuna. Who has Sanjaya been talking to? And when you discover that, then you will have heard the Bhagavad Gita. Now, oh, thanks very much. Mm -hmm.